Hi, I'm Matt Helsley. I work for the VMware Open Source Technology Center. This talk is about Objtool, a, a kernel tool that basically takes in object files produced by the compiler. Um, basically, it's, uh, it works on x86 right now, uh, but it has the foundations for expanding to other architectures. Um, it does certain checks on the object files. It, it's, it checks for stack validation. It checks for certain vulnerability problems like with Spectre. Um, and then more recently, it's been modified to add some stack data to the kernel. Um, and that's going to be useful later. Um, one of the interesting things about the kernel is it does use the ELF file format. Um, it's, so it's not that different from regular executables. Um, there is some magic that the kernel does, but a lot of it also relies on the ELF format. So it builds tables using the ELF sections. Um, ELF is the executable and linkable format. Uh, it's been a standard for a long time. And there are per CPU architecture additions to the standard so that it can work on, on multiple architectures. Um, it's found in object files, the .o files that you see when you compile C code. It's found in executables, the regular programs, and your shared libraries. Um, it describes the actual compiled code as well as how to link it when you're, when you're building the executables and then runtime linking as well, the dynamic linking. So Objtool, what it does is it uses an external library called libelf. Uh, and libelf is responsible for actually loading the, the file into memory using uh, a, a set of data structures that are defined by the standard. Um, and, and what uh, Objtool does is it, it, it takes those data structures and it takes the offsets within the file and converts them into pointer data structures that is re ready to access all of these, these structures. Um, and it will link things like uh, names for, for the various sections into the, the sections. It'll, it'll look up the symbols and produce the hash tables for them, that sort of thing. Um, and then on top of that, it has little flags for checking whether sections have changed, whether we need to write them out to disk, that sort of thing. <clears throat> LibElf itself handles the differences between 32-bit and 64-bit. Uh, so you have different word sizes even on the same architecture. The same architecture can also have different endianness. So you can have big Indian and little Indian on architectures like PowerPC and MIPS, that sort of thing. Um, and what libelf does is it kind of normalizes all this stuff when it puts it in memory. It uses some gener more generic data structures. So for, uh, for example, with the different word sizes, it'll take 32-bit fields and it'll expand them to 64-bit. And then when it's going to put it back on disk, it shrinks it back down. Um, it also uses these functions to basically uh, attach data to the, to the structures so it has some representation of what was on disk um, and what's going to go back. So this is all nice, but the problem with the, the libelf output is it doesn't actually, it's not easily linked together. Um, and, I, and, and for my case, it's also got elf written everywhere, so it kind of gets a little repetitive and your, your eyes kind of glaze over. Um, whereas Optual, what it does is it defines its own data structures, uses a lot of the similar kernel patterns that, that you might be familiar with, and then um, kind of links everything, everything together so that you can easily walk over, say, the sections using, using a linked list, uh, or you can use, look up certain symbols using the standard kernel hash tables, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so what Objtool sees is it sees these object files that come in during the, the kernel build process. This is before the object files get linked into the final kernel. Uh, so it doesn't have things like program header tables, that sort of thing. Um, it's also ma mainly looking at the instructions that are present in the, in the object file. And this is part of the checking process. Um, and this is one of the reasons it's specific to x86 right now. It has code for decoding x86 instructions. Um, and specifically looking at um, the, the way that the x86 manages or doesn't manage the, the stack pointer um, or, or frame pointer. So informally, I'm just going to call these instructions assembly or uh, machine instructions. So um, the other thing that Optional has to deal with is it deals with not only the compiler output, but since kernel developers write assembly on a 
fairly regular basis, or at least deal with assembly on a fairly regular basis, it has to deal with handwritten assembly too. Uh, and this, this can make things a little more difficult, but at the same time, it adds, um, it, it, it's a little easier to follow a human written uh, sequence of assembly instructions. The uh, other problem with, it, with that, though, is the fact that a lot of things, a lot of times the human won't really necessarily add in frame pointers, for example, or they, they might forget some aspect of the assembly code that they need to follow uh, for the kernel to be, to be secure. So Obstool has an opportunity to recognize that and remind people, hey, you need to do this. Um, it started out as a stack validator. It would go through and it would look through the sequence of instructions and, and follow how the, the stack pointer changed and whether or not the back pointer was updated according to those changes. And it could actually warn you, oh, hey, like you're writing this assembly. You, you didn't actually add the back pointer here. And, and those are for um, config frame pointer builds. But at the same time, those builds cost uh, some performance. And so a lot of times, people build the kernel without those frame pointers. And um, so that gets into more of the other uh, aspects of Optual, what it's used for. But uh, the other thing it does is it does some specter checks. So uh, a lot of the specula speculative execution problems that you've seen recently, uh, in the last few years, uh, it will actually check for certain, certain patterns and say, OK, well, this is, this is a problem, and, here's, and you'll be able to go in there and fix it. Uh, it also does some, some U access checking. So that's when you've got code that accesses user space, you want to make sure that it's very um, limited in, in where the kernel can access the user space from. And this will actually check for transitions in and out of those, those sections and, and find when you're, you might be trying to access user space when you shouldn't. So uh, a reminder with the, with the Spectre stuff. This is indirect branches causing problems where you've got speculative execution and an attacker can, can actually control the way that the processor uh, goes in terms of guessing where, where you've got a branch, which direction it's going to go. And then it can observe what happens, look at the timing of, of what happened, and kind of determine the value of, of the branch. Like um, those sorts of things, and so what what this does is uh, it's well, let's see um, so basically what what the attacker can do is they will adjust they, they will run some code that will fill the um, I think it's the the branch history buffer. And the idea is that it, it, the processor will then look at this branch history bus buffer to, to anticipate where it should go. And um, you want to be able to prevent the processor from actually using those heuristics. You want it to use a heuristic that can, it's not really vulnerable to these kinds of attacks. And so the solution is a ret retcline. And this one is, is sort of like where you, you set the return address, but in the return address is actually the place that you want to jump to, either for a call or an actual jump. Um, and the way it works is you basically have a, a, a setup section that calls a function that then takes and puts the return address, uh, replaces the return address with the address you want to go to. Um, and just after that call is normally where any, any sane processor decides that this is the most likely place you're going to return to. And therefore, it doesn't actually look at the, the branch history. It just says, OK, well, you're going to come here next, so I have no problems. And so it'll go through and anticipate ex executing that infinite loop. Um, it won't actually do anything that's driven by the attacker. And so this is, this is how you fix those replicas, but the, or you, how you fix the, the vulnerability. But um, there, are some, there are some pitfalls, like especially in handwritten assembly. If you hand code this, you might actually fall into that infinite loop. Um, and so there are some checks that Optical does to, to verify that you haven't done those things. Um, it will actually look at the, the branches that you're making and say, OK, uh, you're making some indirect calls here, and I don't see this rep clean se sequence after it. Um, it will ignore certain sections, because there are some small sections of kernel code that, uh, that actually do use indirect branches that have been reviewed as safe. Um, and there are also annotations for those sections that it knows to ignore. Um, and let's see, so 
There's an excellent write-up uh, by Google about Spectre, uh, so I definitely recommend checking that out. So the other thing that, that uh, Optical does is it helps with stack traversal. So when you're doing stack traversal, you're generally trying to provide some debug information to the to the user uh, or the kernel developer, most likely, um, and you want to be able to see the sequence of function calls on the stack. What happens is the, the assembly code will adjust the stack pointer. It will set up a call frame. I mean, and that call frame might include the, the frame pointer going back to the previous frame. Uh, but it might not because, of, because you, as I went over earlier, the human might have forgotten it or the compiler may have omitted it in order to get some additional performance. So we want something that's going to be able to replace all of that. It's got to be more reliable, um, and it has to have no overhead as you're normally executing the function calls. So um, we want to we want to avoid adjusting, setting up the frame pointer, if if possible. It also, uh, there's a there's kind of a race here between interrupts and exceptions, and and these stack frames, where um, you could, in between, you know pushing something onto the stack or adjusting the stack pointer, you may not have, there's gonna be a, there's gonna be a tiny window where you haven't adjusted the uh, frame pointer in the stack frame. And, so, and then you can get an exception then, and so you can't necessarily rely on it even then. And that's one of the great things about what Optool does. Um, so uh, when a, so what, what this shows up as is you, you'll actually miss function calls in the stack, you'll see a call, um, and it'll actually go back to the, the previous function, not the actual caller. So sometimes you'll see these strange transitions in the stack trace, and you have to understand that, okay, well, the assembly function, it, may, it omitted this, this particular uh, back pointer. And that makes things challenging. So now we have Tool that introduces this, this work format. And what work does is, um, it, it, it takes and looks at the instruction pointer, the state of the stack at each instruction pointer uh, value, and then it looks for the transitions, and it builds a table that's, that's outside of the, the regular instruction flow. And this table goes into an ELF section, and the, the table is indexed by the, the instruction pointer. So based off of only the instruction pointer and the current stack pointer, you can actually find the backtrace without having to have the, the, the stack or, or the frame pointer in the, in the stack frames. Um, and what it does is it, it looks at, okay, for this instruction pointer, here's the offset from the stack pointer to the beginning of the frame, and then from there you can get the next, or the instruction pointer you're going to return to, and so on. So, you can, uh -huh. so you're writing this information out to the object file, creating uh -huh. the UL section. Who consumes this other than the object tool? Anyone else? The kernel, the kernel itself consumes this. this it's, it's one of those cases where um, the, it's useful for the kernel itself to be able to consume it. So it has, um, it has some pointers that point to the section where, where the section has been loaded, and then it can actually go through, and one of the first things it does is it, uh, it actually sorts the entry by instruction pointer because you can't guarantee that the, uh, instruction, or the entries are sorted initially. This is one of the early boot. It'll go through and sort that. Um, and then it will actually be able to search the table based off of the instruction pointer. So if you have one kernel thread, for example, that wants to know what another kernel thread is doing, this, this one can kind of look at the other one's stack, and it, it, it can follow it without having to worry about, okay, well, are the frame pointers perfectly set up or not? So um, that's useful for a couple, a couple things. Um, let's see here. So one of the things that, uh, so it does the t t stack traversal. Um, okay, so I, I, I mentioned that it sourced the table, and then when you're actually trying to do the stack traversal, it, uh, it looks at the current instruction pointer, the current uh, stack pointer, both of which have to be uh, maintained. They're, they're always correct. Um, it determines where that stack frame is, look, looking through the table, finding the offset, um, and then it takes the instruction pointer, and again, goes back to the previous frame, and so on. Um, so there's no need to keep frame pointers. You get to save all of those 
all of those um, instructions that adjust the stack frame during regular runtime. Uh, but there is a cost to ORC, and that is that you have a, a big table, essentially, that, that's kind of off to the side. It's not typically loaded in cache. It's not, it doesn't have a pro, a, a pro, an impact on the registers uh, at, at runtime, but it is a big table in memory. And, and uh, I think the numbers that I saw were typically like a, a two megabyte to eight megabyte table. Um, this, is, this is actually, it's, it's big for, you know, compared to using frame pointers, but at the same time, it's uh, much smaller than, than the dwarf information. The dwarf information for the kernel is huge. Uh, uh, so it's, it's a little nicer in that respect, but you also still have a bigger kernel. Um, and one of the things that Oric helps with is because you have these reliable stack traces now, you can do things like look into what another kernel thread is doing, a, a task, a process, you know, those things, and figure out, okay, well, it's currently executing these kernel functions, and during, uh, during live patching, we can actually say, okay, well, it's not executing any the function that I'm patching right now, and so I can actually patch that function for that, that task uh, without worrying about it, uh, either one stepping on each other's toes. So, um, Let's see. So it, it, it helps with live patching. Um, and and the, the, main, the main thing is you want to avoid use, uh, patching pieces that are being used by current, currently running processes. Um, the, the other aspect of live patching is it can run without ORC, um, but it, it's less reliable itself. So it'll wait for user space to go all the way back out of the kernel, and then it can actually patch the functions that user space was using. Uh, the, the problem is you can have multiple processes coming in and out of the kernel, and so there's a chance that the, the functions are, are always in use, um, or might always seem to be in use because you can't look at the stack reliably. But once you can look at the stack reliably, you're much more likely to be able to patch the functions out. So um, there are some more, more checks being considered on, on LKML. Um, I, I saw one recently. Uh, and there, you know, there are some other things that I'm actually working on where trying, I'm trying to incorporate a tool called record mcount into ops tool. And wh what that does is that one looks at the, um, the function entry tracing. So you have, uh, you have the, the standard compiler tools will generate a function call at the very beginning of each function. And um, in order to help you do profile generation and, and develop a, a call graph, um, and so rec what record end count does is it goes and turns all those calls into no ops um, and records the locations of those calls so that later on we can do dynamic tracing where you can enable tracing of certain functions within the kernel at runtime and you don't have to worry about constantly having that overhead of, of having the, the call graph being recorded. Um, and that's what record end count does. But it's not currently incorporated in Java tool. It's, it's its own ELF parser. It has its own structures. It has some very weird patterns there um, that aren't really easy to understand unless you really stare at the code for a long time. And so I'm trying to incorporate it into Java tool and use, use Java tools, um, better ELF interfaces, their, their standard kernel patterns to, to kind of make it easier to understand and, and more maintainable. Um, and the one thing about recording count that does present some problems is it's a little more um, widely supported on multiple architectures, whereas Optual right now is x86 specific. So that's one of the things I'm work working on testing and making sure that I can build Optual for other architectures. Uh, the, other, the other things that might be in the future, um, replacing sort x table, which is very similar to record and count. It, it goes through and looks at the exception entries for the kernel, and then it sorts those. Um, and then there's also one called generate ksims, which walks through the kernel table and, and finds the, the symbol names and then makes those available to the kernel too. Um, so those, those could all sort of be uh, incorporated into, into Optual as different little subcommands. Optual has a, a check subcommand, for example, and a, and a generate subcommand for the checking and generating work data respectively. And then um, one of the things that we can do that, that I think we can do is we can also have it so that you only have to run object tool once to do all those passes. So you could do a check pass, a generate pass, 
and then and then make the tracing tool uh, pass as well. Um, and so you would only have to load the ELF data once. You could process the, the whole file with the different passes and then return. Whereas right now, you reload the ELF file. So. All right, that's it. Does anybody have any questions? How is uh, record and count different from F-trace? Um, it's part of what F-trace uses, yeah. So it's it's building the tables inside the kernel that F-trace uses. It's kind of like the way that that uh, Optical builds the work tables. Record and count is kind of the corresponding part for F-trace. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.